Good afternoon. Our speaker is John Simpson. I would like to offer a double introduction, if I could. The first is slightly stiff, and I'm going to read it, because I would like you all to know, particularly the ones who are not as old as some of the faculty in the room, what kind of work John has done, and perhaps where to find it, both to, uh, where to find it on the internet and where to find it in person. So I have to read this smilingly, because this is John's return home. This is a home of sorts, perhaps more than home, because we're living inside his, his mind. Uh, you know, it's a, a bit of a complicated relationship we're having with John, not only tonight, but on a daily basis. So John Simpson Architects came to prominence in the 1990s with a master plan for Paternoster Square by St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He pioneered mixed-use urban planning long before it was adopted as government policy in the UK. And these are very radical issues, I think, for, to, to appreciate and understand. This, ideas that are very routine today used to be just extraordinarily unusual a short time ago. Through his work, he has had considerable influence in bringing the classical tradition to prominence with buildings such as Queen's Gallery in Buckingham Palace, his buildings at Poundary for the Duchy of Cornwall, Kensington Palace for Queen Elizabeth's Diamond Jubilee, and the National Defense Rehabilitation Facility for injured service personnel near Loughborough. Loughborough? Loughborough, sorry, Loughborough. Within academia, his works include buildings at Gonville and Keyes, Keyes College at, and at Peterhouse, the University of Cambridge, at late Margaret Hall at the University of Oxford, and the new Macram Yard Quad at Eden College at Windsor, his, uh, his addition music rooms at the Royal College of Music in London, and of course, the Walsh Family Hall School of Architecture here. The work is extraordinary. It's broad. It is beautiful. It's well-conceived, executed, acclaimed. I remember in 1999, 2000, where I first saw Queen's Gallery in London, it was astounding. It was astounding because only 25 years ago, there was so little new classical architecture built in the world that the building in this location by a, a new architect in a new form was completely unanticipated and pretty thoroughly unusual. Uh, happily in 25 years, an awful lot has happened, and yet, John's work still remains standing, beautiful, proud, and although so much more has happened, his contributions are already seriously written up in the, in the history of architecture with, with very bright words and will continue to be in the future. Now, your presence here, John, is very unusual, and I'll return to the question of this being your school. The most beautiful thing about, about, thing about architecture, about architectural design, is the fact that Ideas get born in the mind, and they're born about this size, maybe. Maybe as a piece of paper, maybe this size, right, as a diagram. And then they grow, and they grow. And then one day, one walks through a, through a frame, right? And this enormous thing in place that, that has come out of that magical seed. And so for you to be here and to be through a building has gone through this transformation from seed to final place, is a remarkable thing. It must be a, a really exhilarating thing. But for us, it's also exhilarating because we live here every day. We love this place. It is our home. And so to invite you to be with us today is an unusual and unique pleasure. Thank you for being here. And the rest of the afternoon is yours. Please join me in welcoming John Simpson Holmes. Thank you, Stefan. It's such a, it's being here. It's just so nice to come back. It's, yeah, it's, you know, after so long, and to spend, you know, spent the, the afternoon with the students looking around and talking to the students. And it's so wonderful to see the place sort of being used so well and come to life the way it is. Before I left London, I was at a gathering where everybody was talking about all these schools of architecture which are popping up everywhere. And this whole insurrection that I think the, the Scandinavians have put this, this, have described it as is really quite exciting. We're suddenly, I think, seeing quite a moment happening in history. And, and I suppose for me, when I started, there were no schools of architecture teaching classical and traditional architecture. There were no summer schools. There weren't even practices where one could in turn doing anything like that. But I was lucky. I really was lucky. I had the Soane Museum. And it's the Soane Museum, because today you think of the Soane Museum and it's a place that's run like a museum. You touch everything, everyone wears white gloves. 
taking out all these drawings. But it wasn't like that then. It was the way Soane left it and what he created it as the place to learn all about that school architecture. That's why it's got all those amazing casts and pieces of old buildings in there. And he's got his whole archive of drawings. He bought the archive of the Adam Brothers, and that's all in there, as well as Henry Holland and people like that. And it's an amazing place to, to learn. And that's where and I owe everything to John Smith from that point of view. And then at the end of all that, I had to go out. And there was nobody I could work for. It just had to be done. There I was in 1980 out there building buildings. And it was a terrible time to start a practice. Margaret Thatcher was fighting the unions and everything was going on. The economic situation was dire. But we found some work. And I suppose we had quite a bit of time on it. And so me and a few friends organized an exhibition of the work that we were doing which you see here, an exhibition called Real Architecture. The real thing, you see. <laughs> and we managed to raise 500 pounds and we organized this exhibition at the Building Center. And you know what the Building Center is? It's where brick companies sell their bricks and where you go and you choose a carpet because you're thinking of what kind of carpet you might use to, 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 for an office building. And to our astonishment, it was real astonishment, I can tell you. Our exhibition hit all the main newspapers at the time. The Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian, Sunday papers, everything. You know, they picked up on this. And the building centre didn't know what hit them. They'd never had an exhibition so well attended. The whole world sort of came down to this, to, to this exhibition. And it really took the world by storm. I mean, we had people coming down from pop stars like Bob Geldorf, the Prince of Wales, who asked whether he'd come round. And that's how I got to know the Prince of Wales. And he was determined to champion what we were doing. And it also happens at the time, the rather horrendous scheme was put forward uh, to redevelop the area around St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, Prince of Wales was particularly horrified about. And I agreed to do a counter scheme for that, which you can see here, which was really to demonstrate what was possible if one was going to do, redesign the whole uh, area around St. Paul's and do it in a uh, uh, traditional manner. He championed it at the, what was called the, that's uh, now known as the Luftwaffe speech. And the counter scheme was got overwhelming public support and the evening standard paid for the planning permission which went in. And it was interesting, the comments in the comments book, we fell into two categories, uh, public absolute support for the whole thing, architects, pastiche was the word they keep shouting. That's what it is. But it inter it's interesting looking back at the posters for our public present presentation. And it's interesting to see this was probably the first time the principles of traditional urbanism were given a true public hearing. And you see the slogans on the exhibition of posters creating streets and squares, urban, walkable urban spaces, a mix of uses in a traditional manner. This was soon followed by Boundary and Leon Freire's master plan for, our, for that. And we were commissioned to design the first public building at Poundbury in Palmery Square in the first, first phase uh, of Poundbury. And that was followed by designing houses, creating row houses and streets of houses, mixed use buildings individual houses as well, creating arcades and, and public spaces and squares of this time. And it was really the whole drive towards sustainability, which helped us a great deal after this, because what happened, politicians got interested in the whole thing. And the whole idea of reducing the reliance on the motor car became very significant, certainly in England. And, and uh, the idea of using designing urban extensions like this 
Newcastle Great Park that we did, all modelled on traditional towns, was was it became pretty much the rage, and we were commissioned to design Fairford Lees, which was just outside Aylesbury, and it was conceived really very much as a series of neighbourhoods, each planned within a sort of a radius of a five minute walking distance. And then, most amazingly, we were actually hired by a local authority. And this is working for a local authority at Soli Hall in Birmingham, where we designed and got this whole idea of a new settlement through the planning process, et cetera, for them, public consultation, all that, and then designed the uh, master plan and the whole center for it, which you can see here. And it was amazing. You know, everybody then was saying, you can't have shops, you can't have mixed use. And here, you know, this small settlement, not very big at all, it's about 3,000 units altogether. And, you know, there was 16 shops, a supermarket, you know, a pub, a library, health center, schools, social housing, etc. And it was all in there. And all this done, much in the face of institutional resistance. And it was not just so much in the planning system, but the, all the rules, all the basic rules, highway rules, regulations, etc., were all against this kind of thing. It was in, almost very, almost impossible to do it without finding clever ways around it. And of course, that's without talking about the ingrained commercial prejudice against the developments of, of this time. And of course, in addition to that, the idea of the design codes was developed, which was really done with each of these things, describing the local architectural vernacular and was used for these developments. So as to make sure that they had a sense of place about them and a sense of belonging to the area in which they were built. And as Stephanos was saying, this was all conceived in the last century. It was in the last century. And looking back, you can see that there was a moment of dramatic change till the profession fought back. And I think we're seeing a similar moment now with the rebellion, and it's going to change and really shoot out until, of course, the empire strikes back again. There we are. Hopefully it won't. Um, but anyway, Going on from this, the whole idea of, 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 of urban design, et cetera, is, continues to be a major strand of other work and a practice. These are some, just to show you some more recent work in a, a vein. This is in Paris, just outside Paris, in fact, in France. And you can see the very French characteristic buildings and buildings designed so they look like they, they've been there forever. This is another de development, which is just on the drawing boards at the moment, Cambridge, and it's a development, an entirely new settlement of about 10,000 near dwelling, a very significant mix of uses, which has been incorporated and or designed to fit into the Cambridge, Cambridge, Cambridge vernacular. The other of the Prince of Wales's influence was his institute and the School of Architecture, where I began my first teaching forays. And this is an example of one, a project that we did with the students exploring the origins of the Doric order and how that all came together. But although the school didn't survive, the legacy for our office at this school was really very significant. I mean, all the, the key people in my office Joanna Bachoviak, who actually is now a key person, uh, my right-hand person in, in, in practice, were all trained during this period. It's the same Hugh Petter at Adam Architects, Ben Pentreath, the, the, the last year's Treehouse Laureate, were all from the, and as a result of the Prince of Wales' school. And that was vital to us as a practice. And I can't overstate, too, the significance of this school and we had, I mean, the number of staff we had from this school is, was actually very important to us and was a significant a means which allowed us as a practice to be able to develop and design many of the buildings that we did. Uh, these are some pictures of the office, just in case you're interested. Some of the more 
parts, fancy parts of the office rather than the, the drawing office, which, which you can imagine what it, that, that's like. But the principles that were significant to me as a practice were, in the first place, making sure that we didn't end up finding ourselves specializing in one type of building. It was quite important to me, I felt, that uh, we actually designed different types of buildings where each building, every time you did a different building, it informed the next and, and, and you got a good overview of things rather than ending up with a very myopic view of architecture. And that's pretty difficult to do because once you design a, a, a successful, I don't know, restaurant, you find everybody comes to you for more successful restaurants and you really have to work hard to get, make sure that this is not what's happening and you have to twist things and pretend that the restaurant is not a restaurant, but it's actually a library <laughs> and convince them that, that you can do it. So we, I think we fairly successful. We designed galleries, we designed academic institutions. Academic institutions are very useful because they incorporate lots of different kinds of spaces, etc. This is the debating chamber at Eton College, which you can see here. We designed museums, we designed a chapel, which recently finished in, in, in the perpendicular style in, in, uh, in Chelsea. We designed cottages, we designed country houses, we designed residential buildings in cities. See, we, and also, I was, for me, if it was an interesting job, nothing was too big or too small. And again, looking at things at different scales is really quite significant, quite important in the development of the practice, the development of the architecture we did. This is just a small garden pavilion at Sheringham in uh, Norfolk. The other end of the scale, this is the Defence and National Rehabilitation Centre in Leicestershire, which is 400,000 square feet of medical rehabilitation space which we designed in, in, into a, a parkland sitting, you can see there, with a, a lake down at that end and the parkland, which all belonged originally to, to a country house. And the idea that we did is to really design it as a series of smaller buildings, which were all linked together around cloisters, courtyards, and internal gardens. So you created the kind of space that was particularly conducive the rehabilitation of patients. And this was extended out into the surrounding mm -hmm. parkland. And then there's furniture. It's always good to design furniture, Bob, yes. <laughs> and there's amazing you know, furniture, fittings, etc. But there's always things that people haven't done. I, mean, I was shocked. Nobody designed a, a, a stacking Klismos chair. There you are, you know. This is my take on Lutchins's Napoleon chair, all using ancient Roman precedent, looking at it. This is why I call it the Caesar chair. And variations of that, looking also at patterns in, in fabric and designing things like that. But the most important thing for me was really the whole idea of designing buildings so that they fitted in and were part and extended the sense of place in which they were the design. I mean, all these buildings here are new in Chelsea. These buildings are new in Westminster. And to do that, you really have to widen what you're designing. You can't just decide to design in one particular way. And so you have to design sometimes a, 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 a medieval building with a thatched roof, or perhaps a, 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 a Renaissance, a, 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 a Romanesque building in this manner. And this is a war memorial for the Royal Artillery, or indeed a Gothic building, the, the necessity arises. And also updating the tradition is such an important thing, making sure that what you're doing is within the tradition, but updating it, uh, using everything here, for instance, that uh, fountain you see there is also uh, not just there for decoration, but actually uses a process of evaporative cooling to cool the interior of the building. And of course, solar collectors, the most ugly things you can ever come across, stuck all over buildings, but you can design them in so they don't ruin the architecture in your building. 
as we did here in Lady Margaret Rome. And the other thing that we really had to do is the whole business of how you built construction. Because veneer construction is no good. It just isn't any good for traditional architecture. And you, that's what, I mean, it's so insubstantial. You just can't keep the water out, which is why these buildings, these modern buildings that use cavity walls, etc., end up looking like that. And we all know the traditional building relies on the moldings to actually control all that uh, um, aging so that you actually get a patina happening on there. But of course, if you insist on building everything load-bearing like that, you probably end up with half the number of clients. So we had to come up with a way which would allow us to build proper, real, traditional walls, which actually behaved like traditional walls, but do it the sort of speed that people expected to see in, 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 in the modern age. So what we devised is a means of actually building the, 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 the uh, building so that you took the external wall off the critical path. So you could build the building using a frame going right up. The building, the, 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 the whole building could actually continue being fitted out, etc. And while you sort of slowly built up a solid self-supporting wall on the outside and doing it in your, at, at your own leisure doing it properly and building it properly with the skills that you really need. And then you can design in the traditional manner, but you don't necessarily have to design something which has been seen before. You can always put it together in a different sort of way so that it appears fresh. And you really have to do that because every generation wants to feel and wants to make the, the tradition. So it needs to be put together. And here you've got really archaic columns at the Queen's Gallery, the entrance hall. And yet the way it's put together and the way it comes across is not as a building, as an interior or as that you would have seen before. Uh, and that's, I think, very important. But having said that, it's also sometimes very important to make sure that you're being very faithful. I mean, for instance, this, this debating chain was designed very much to revive an architectural form, which most people don't know anything about unless they, 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 they're really interested in their history books. And it was really designed very much based on the uh, council chamber at ancient Praini, complete with the altar right in the center, which there it is, providing a, a, a lectern in the middle. Um, and of course, Architecture is there also to educate. The portico at the Queen's Gallery was specially des designed as it was an entrance to, the, to an art gallery and a celebration of the origi origins of Western art and architecture. And it distinguished, and that's what distinguishes it as an entrance to a gallery, to the Queen's Gallery, which is different to all the other entrances at Buckingham Palace. But more significantly, I think, it also prepares visitors for what they're about to experience inside. And it helps them and reminds them of certain things so that they can appreciate the art that they're about to see. I mean, that's why, for instance, it uses these great archaic Doric columns from the Temple of Hera, Pista. The earliest known form of Doric. Why? The open pediment reveals the construction of the Doric roof as described by Vitruvius. It's complete with the embellishment you might expect to find in an ancient building. And of course, the disposition of the elements is really recalls the Erechtheion, the Acropolis in Athens, particularly in joy projects that require something impossible in. And I'll give you an example of this. This is Peter House in Cambridge. Peter House, the historic part of Peter House, has two courts, Old Court and Gisbert Court here. And one of the things about the Cambridge courts that makes them difficult from the different from the Oxford courts is that they're usually three-sided, either with a, a screen across one end, as at King's College, or, as you can see here, the old court of Peterhouse, 
where you have the chapel positioned in there, giving you an open-sided or partially open-sided third side to the court. And of course, Peterhouse being old and of the age it is, grew incrementally and has significant elements, particularly of old court, which are medieval. But that was all refaced in the 18th century. So one of the characteristics of Peterhouse, and of course, just to show you Gisborne Court, this is 1830s Gothic, and the range you see here is actually a medieval range, which on one side is prefaced in to be classical, on this side it's prefaced to be Gothic. And so a key feature of Peterhouse is these three-sided courts, which are all uniform in style. And then what happened in the 1930s, I think it was, is this screen here was knocked down and they built an ugly bathhouse here. And the college needing more accommodation decided it's time they put that right. And we were commissioned to design a new building to complete the court here. Uh, so we designed and had a look at designing something which we took and, and was reminiscent of the old uh, screen that ran across that and uh, provided the new accommodation very much in the manner of the uh, 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 chapel in Old Court, as you can see here with a, a junior common room which runs in that significant location. And then, hey, Preston, there's your building. Quite straightforward. We used a brick which was similar to the gaunt brick, which you can't get anymore in, in, in Cambridge because it's not made, and a stone which matched the, the rest of the court and building on the Gothic detailing so that it all worked in and worked as part of the college itself. But beyond the calm of this exterior, there, is a great, there was a great deal more that needed to be resolved. The site this triangular shape you see in that. between historic buildings. This, these are grade one landmark buildings. These are so it's grade two. And then we had on the third side an ancient wall, which was that green ancient wall. And if that wasn't enough, we had a service route which ran right through the middle of the site. These were the kitchens over here, and they used to take everything across there, so all the deliveries and all the rubbish was taken out right through our site. So we had to devise a way of dealing with this and have to reroute that and run it underneath the building, bringing it in, not underground, but in a passageway, which actually went to a ramp underneath the building, as you can see there. And so the building was actually made up of three elements that you can see that with a passageway underneath which all had to be reconciled. And this is the view from the back, looking across. So there's the, the cross fen court. This is the ancient wall. There's the, the passageway underneath the building. One part of the building up there, two stories high, running through. And then, of course, we had to reconcile the geometry to make that work using this circular stair, which runs up through the center of the building in this manner. But then, Another thing that I'm a great believer in is that when designing a new building, you need to take cues from the buildings around you, designed by your predecessors. This is essential to some extent in ensuring, it is ensuring that the work of many hands that's done over sometimes hundreds of years results in something which is coherent. I also believe that you, as a designer, need to consider what cues you need to leave behind and build into your building to make sure that future architects also adhere to what you're intending to do. And they can pick up on that. So you get that continuity working across generations. And this is an example, and this time at Oxford rather than Cambridge. This is Lady Margaret Hall, the first college for women at either Oxford or Cambridge. And you can see that the college itself, it's an amazing collection of 20th century classical building, except for these two buildings. 
And then you could see, look, it, the college started in 1875. It was extended by Basil Champneys, then by another architect, Reginald Blomfield, and then Gilbert Scott over here. Uh, and they were all building, curiously, extremely, you know, uh, all solid little buildings, all designed. And you then realize when Raymond Nevis builds his bit, that they were all trying to design it to set the foundations in place to build a series of quadrangles. And it's not until the 1960s, which is almost a hundred years later, that the first quadrangle gets built. So it takes that long. And here's one of Raymond Erith's drawings showing the way he was exploring even further quadrangles. And of course, all this happens well until the 1970s, when the college decides to take on a modernist architect who was determined to ignore all the curious. And look what happened. In one fell swoop, a hundred years of work by a whole succession of architects is lost. It's the story of the 20th century, isn't it? So there you are. Uh, and happily, and they were going to build those two point blocks there. They were going to build three more running all the way across there. The, happily, the, the college sorts all sense and decided abandoned this course, and we were uh, uh, commissioned to come and repair this damage, but they weren't going to make the job easy for us. You couldn't knock those buildings down. We had to design something so they could be subsumed into the natural development form of a college, which of course was a whole series of what angles. So we designed these L-shaped buildings, which you see here. So that by doing that, we could subsume these point blocks so that you could then still define a chord on this side. We were defining chords behind on the others and to make it all work. And I was very anxious that when we designed these, that this all connected through and linked to any future buildings, which were going to be designed and built as at the front of the college. This is the main front of the college, the main approach. So we considered what would happen here and considered how the whole thing should work so as to connect through as we were designing it. And we picked up, and how did we do this? We picked up on the architecture of the existing buildings. This is one of the buildings by Blogfield. This is the library by, or part of the library by Raymond Darris. So our buildings are really red brick buildings with simple stone dressings very much picking up on the architecture and the level of architecture that the other buildings that were existing there had, but also incorporated ar arcades, as you can see here, which is a common feature in Oxford colleges. And then in doing so, you can see here where we've built in and subsumed the blocks into these, so these this facade. Luckily, he, the, the modern buildings were built in red brick, so we could do this and created more quadrangles around the back of, of, of these blocks. And of course, the buildings were three-story buildings. The upper stories are uh, really student accommodation with teaching accommodation at the ground floor, which is this lecture theater come recital room that you see, all these dining spaces and breakout rooms. And the college seemed to be so, so happy with what we did that they did give us the uh, uh, commission to continue the whole thing across the front of the college, which was left this way, sort of unfinished since Raymond Harris designed it. So the space outside was neither part of the college nor part of the street network outside, just a leftover car park, as you can see, which we transformed with two new buildings and these gatehouses, which you see either side which were designed to complement Raymond Arrett's great arch at the end. Uh, one of the curious things about Raymond Arrett's building is this very windowless, blind top story. And that top story there could have benefited from windows there because it was just a corridor behind there. But it all made sense when you realized that Raymond Arrett had designed this very much inspired by the Porta Maggiore, in Rome. And of course, with its great big Claudian aqueduct across the top, which also, of course, 
explains the reason for his blind top story. But what I was interested in was this rather curious little monument that you've got here outside, which was outside the walls of ancient Roman times. And it's embellished with these rather curious circular devices that turn out to be ancient Roman kneading machines for making bread. Because this was a monument to a baker. And I thought, we'd use this embellishment for the tympana of our pediments to the gatehouses as an appropriate way to continue the architectural narrative of the entrance that Raymond Arith started. So effectively, what we're doing is responding to the development form of the buildings, the nature of the materials, as well as the architecture of the buildings and the narrative that's supported. And by doing that, ensure that we got a con continuity between the old and the new, so that the difference is almost imperceptible on the ground. And just while I'm on this, I thought I might sort of explain some of the spaces as well. But the lesson to learn from this is just how, it, how important it is to read the cues and to set up your own cues for the future architects so that they can design their buildings and make it possible for that continuity that I was talking about earlier to carry on generation after generation. This here is the Porter's Lodge. You can go through, whoops. So that's the interior of the Porter's Lodge, the graduate building on the other side, and some of the, what are the interior spaces there. And of course, the view you get of the main entrance now of Lady Margaret Hall as you approach from the, the floor of gardens, which runs straight up towards that entrance. This is another example. And this is the Royal College of Music, which is the main conservatoire in London. I mean, there are two. This is the main, this one and the Royal Academy. And this is in Kensington. Uh, you can see the Royal Albert Hall there. And this is the area where the museums are. It's got the Imperial Hall Museum, the Science Museum, the Imperial Institution, BNA here. And this was one of Prince Gordon. Prince Consort's projects that he was really connected with. And he was particularly involved with the Royal College of Music, which is why it's positioned so centrally, right in the middle of there, the whole complex, right opposite of the Royal Albert Hall. And you can see it here. This is the view that you get from the main entrance looking towards the Royal Albert Hall with the grand steps leading up to the hall as the ground drops towards the RCM building. And that's the RCM building. You can see designed along that axis with two symmetrical towers either side and the central space, of course, becoming quite significant and important in there, looking back at the Royal Albert Hall. And of course, when this was designed by Arthur Blomfield, who is no relation to Reginald Blomfield, when he designed this very much based on that, that main axis running through the building, which was later extended with a new concert hall, which was also put on axis, quite understandably. And then in the 1970s was extended even further with the uh, new opera house, which you can see here, which was put in uh, to the west of the concert hall, parallel to the concert hall itself. And we were brought in a few years ago, a couple of months seven years ago, to add some new facilities on the other side of the concert hall, which included a number of recital rooms, practice rooms, a museum, recording studio, various teaching spaces, and to add in much needed breakout spaces, which were really missing from the original building. The original building was never designed to have as much going on in it as it now has. And also to provide a sort of a center for the students to be able to sort of just a, a social center for the students. And what I was very anxious to do is to return back to the simple plan Arthur Blomfield had first put in. Because what had happened once the opera house was put in is that they didn't address that at all. So you basically got an opera house in there 
And then all the circulation works because of the changes in level went up and down stairs became very complex and very tortuous. So it became very much sort of rabbit, rabbit warren. And the simplicity was lost, which we reintroduced here. So you came in the middle, made the most of this central space, which was so significant. And it had a whole circulation, which then fed into the various performance spaces that ran along there. This is the entrance hall as it was, uh, quite an ornate entrance hall, but really quite small, which we opened up. Um, the war memorial from there, and also behind that opened up the space so as to make something a lot more spacious that would work there and extend it onto the east side where our whole commission was really based. So you had a, all of your spaces on this side, which because of the drop in the land, we were able to put the performance spaces underneath an open courtyard here. So you ended up with an open courtyard at the entrance level with a great sort of foyer space across here with a cafe and place for people to socialize, a green room on this side for the performers, dining room for the students and so on. So they could use that. And this is the sort of courtyard space that we created. There wasn't a lot of external wall on this building because of the nature of it. So we could really go to town with the brickwork here. And that's, you can just see the courtyard behind this was the foyer space going through here. And then the space between that and the old building was taken up with a roof lit a hall with a staircase leading down to the facilities, lower levels that you can see here. So at the lower level, you've got the recital rooms here, a museum at this end, a library here, a recording studio and so on. And this is at the bottom and through here is the museum. We have a remarkable collection of instruments, probably the best in the country in, 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 in England. And then the recital room or the major recital room itself that you see here, which was really designed with quite a, a sophisticated acoustic system with banners, acoustic banners behind this transcendent screen, which could be retracted up and down to change the acoustics. And it could be used both for performance and as a recording studio as well, which you see here. And of course, what we really did, did here is really set up the organizational and architectural that underpinned the way the building would work. And although we were unable to, on the, unable to build the other side of it, which related to the opera house, effectively, it was a compelling thing. We knew we'd given them a legacy that they could implement in the future. And in a way, although this is all dealing with an existing building, in a way, it's even more important, I think, sometimes with a new building to make sure that you put in a legacy of cues that could be picked up. And I thought a good example of that is literally Wall Family Hall here. And I went back to some of our design drawings we had. And of course, the thing about Wall Family Hall is that it was really designed to be shared, or the block was really designed to be shared with the School of Art on the other side. So effectively, what, what we have here is only two sides of the court. And it's quite important as to what happens on the other side for the School of Architecture. We know if we're not careful, something could happen there. So what I used, which would be totally detrimental to what you've got. So one of the reasons why the tower is positioned where it is is so as to articulate the court and the spaces within the court. So you basically got a series of spaces and formal space on the side, a private space at the back, a yard space down here where you could sculpture studios opposite the, the, the bobs, um, furniture workshop and so on. And you got that working in there. But what was more significant is that tower was really designed. It's got a lit, uh, an elevator in it, and it was really designed to provide a core, a circulation core on this side, so you could link through to uh, the future building on that side 
on various different levels. It also meant that you could actually extend the architecture school on this side of the, of, of the terrace. So you could get, I mean, you can't build a building without extensions. So you could extend that on that side and then tie it all in, in a manner which would actually work. And possibly even on this side, because you can connect through at different levels, you could probably have some shared space at this end, which could be shared between the two schools. And the most important part about it was to actually make sure that you got the enclosure arrangement of the different parts of that courtyard. I mean, a, a ramp, for instance, was actually deliberately put in so as to distinguish that space and set, get people used to that space as being one proper space so that it wasn't then encroached upon in the future. And you could then get the new building to actually have its own entrance on the side and perhaps also relate to this space and to provide the enclosure that you really needed. So you could turn this in a much more defined urban series of urban spaces. So having said that, I think I'm going to move on to one of my final points, which is really to say something about the fourth dimension. Because architecture, everybody knows is three-dimensional, but you've also got a sense of time to it. Something that people don't do much of these days because, and it's probably a result of, of the hangover from the indoctrination of the modernists and the modernist era of the 20th century, where you really weren't allowed to have architecture if it wasn't of its time. But we all know one of the ways or one of the things that makes traditional towns and cities so attractive is the variety of architecture that you get with each era of development having its own distinctive features. The town, this helps you and helps us all find our way around as we know that the older buildings, original to the development, are more likely to be where the center is. And as human beings, we're very good at recognizing patterns. And by having a logical pattern like that, it, it ties the whole place together. So the, actually, the variety that you put in is actually also giving you the unity, which is quite the opposite of a suburban estate, because although we know the variety is put in there, which each house it wants to be different from its neighbor, but because it's completely random and there's no pattern, what that variety does is make it disparate rather than unifying it all together. And this is something which we use frequently in urban design, but is also the same in building, because where you've got buildings which have had additions added to them, the changes that have happened in a long period of time, you see, and you see this in many country houses in England, you can build up that sort of unity, even though you've got a variety of different spaces within it. And this is something we have to look at when we were designing a, 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 a new house in, in this village of Whirlwell. Whirlwell has really got all, it, it's actually got 60 listed buildings, most of them uh, dating from early 1500s, mid 1500s. They're all buildings like this, sort of half timbered, thatched roof, that sort of thing. And it seemed appropriate if we were adding a new building that it really should sort of be part of the village which we've done here. And of course, buildings of that period are all quite straightforward. They're very long and thin due to the construction method that was used and also have a particular feature because most of these buildings belong to an era before fireplaces and chimneys were common. And the only way you could heat a house like this was to have a brazier here with a fire in it, smoke cleanse of went up and went out through a vent in the roof. And if you had a, a lower ceiling than that, the house would catch fire. So you didn't really have much choice but to do that. And as part of all this, there was a very sophisticated system to do with the way the hall was vented. So as to make sure that the air came in here and you didn't get a negative pressure happening there. So you had what was, what was called a screens passage, which you see here, which had doors on both sides. And what happened there was because 
by designing it like this, it didn't really depend on which way the wind was blowing. You still got, you wouldn't get a negative pressure. You'd get the, the ventilation in, and that was controlled with a series of smaller doors in the screen's passage. This is a view looking inside the great hall you see here, and the building is all built out of green oak, which is with mortise, mortise and tenon joints, as you can see there, with pegs, which all create this hammer beam roof, which you see there. And of course, the great oriel window uh, lights down with the space uh, there from the west. Um, but if we look the other side, you can look back and you can see the screen's passage on this side and the entrance which you saw earlier. And this is the first place where something begins to happen. Of course, with once the chimneys are invented and the chimney were built into the house, the whole screen's passage lost its function. You didn't have to have small little doors. You could have a nice big opening so as to make it look much more spacious and grand. And of course, that would have been done in a later Renaissance period. So you would end up with a Jacobean classical details for the screen built in front of what is an older Gothic structure, which you can see back there. And just to make it even more convincing, what I decided to do was to build it. So it was slightly off center. So it looked like it's definitely an addition. Couldn't have been built like that in the first place. And of course, the vent at the top gets converted into a lantern because it's not needed anymore. And of course, that has a, a weather vane on the top. And I couldn't understand why people always have the direction arrows underneath or, or outside. And I decided to put it on underneath because that way you could actually see which way the wind was blowing before you went outside. So you knew whether you needed to wear your thick coat or not. And of course, once you've got chimneys built into the building, you've got a lot more flexibility in terms of the planning of the space. And from that point of view, service areas have been added on as extensions on the outside so that the old spaces could actually be upgraded into, 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 into as you can see, into an elegant drawing room, as you can see. Uh, and of course, would have been done in a sort of 18th century style because that's when it would have happened. And then out it goes and you go out into a, a Regency uh, conservatory built into the garden which of course is an Italian garden to complete with a, with a canal and a bridge running through that, which looks like it goes on forever. But of course, the reason it does that is because it's laid out in false positions. So all plants get closer together and get shorter. So it looks like it goes on forever. And more than that, uh, there is a water gate, which leads you into the canal because it's a swimming pool. And is, you can see up here, there is a retractable telescopic cover, which comes out from the bridge and covers the pool. Because in England, there's no point having an outdoor pool. You'd only end up using it twice a year. And that's the 21st century part. And as a conclusion, I'm just going to say, it's important to remember as the architect working on your own. You're more like a conductor of an orchestra. A lot of other people, there's a whole team of people behind you which you've got to carry, carry along with you. I mean, to be able to do these sort of copper roofs, the great acroterium there, you need these craftsmen and women to be able to make it happen. You need carvers because all ornament starts as a carving, whether it's a cast metal work, cast block, decorative painting is, will probably have the most significant impact on the interior of your building. Joinery too. And also brickwork. Skilled bricklayers are absolutely important for a building, including stones and all stone starts as starts as clay molded models, which are then used by the stonemasons to cut. And as, as you can see here, and of course, you've also got people like, you know, Sandy Stoddard sculptors who also need to contribute and you need to make sure that their designs are appropriate and work in with what you're designing. For instance, 
the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace, then Sandy embellished the entrance. Along the lines of the theme that we put in, uh, which was really to do with the origins of Western art, and he designed a frieze depicting the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, the allegorical scenes from the Iliad and the Odyssey, the first works of literature in Western art. And of course, you're all familiar with this work by Sandy. And I'm going to leave you with this design, which is also just coming off the drawing boards, which is a new master plan and buildings for an expanded campus, Buckingham University, which you see here. And I leave you with that. And I'm sure you've, you've had enough of me droning on. Any questions? Yes. And I'm always saying to students, you know, when you're an architect, you have to have fun and you never have to give up on it. And I think you can demonstrate this kind of playful and really on the bridge thing way of doing architecture is so encouraging. I think you have to enjoy yourself. Boots. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, I was actually here as an undergraduate student, uh, when it was first announced that you were going to be designing this building. I think I was in the room with the first presentation of to design. I was hoping that you could elaborate on some of the challenges and choices that you face, uh, designing specifically within the Notre Dame campus context how, I guess, the, the choice between privileging contextual relationship to privileging narrative, which is obviously very important to this school. You're trying to get me into trouble, aren't you? <laughs> I think w w one of the things that, and it's not unique to, 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 to Notre Dame, is designing buildings which are going to be sustainable in the future. Systems are in place that have developed for other reasons in the recent past. I mean, for instance, we wanted to design the building so it had openable windows everywhere. And we were told, you can't, that's not how it works. You do that, it's going to cost more money because people will leave, leave windows open and all this kind of thing. And we were overruled on that. There's nothing we could do. We designed some openable windows, but that was a negotiation that we managed to get as a concession. But it didn't stop us from designing the buildings so that they were not deep buildings, but buildings which were modest depth. So that in the future, in 25 years, with all the fans, etc., and need renewing, etc., that the building doesn't become naturally ventilated and the windows are work can then be or openable windows can then be put in. If we'd sort of fallen for the whole thing and then so we do do that, we can have a very deep building, that kind of thing couldn't have happened. So there are things that you do have to sometimes make uh, concessions on in the interim, but you make sure that in the long term, the, the building doesn't preclude doing the sensible thing. So there's the kind of things, but we have to deal with that on every project because the pressures are, because if you did design a deep building, you have a lot more square footage have less external wall, divide one by the other, and the cost per square foot is, of course, a lot cheaper. If you design thinner buildings, you have less square footage, you have more external wall. External wall is one of the most expensive elements of a new building, so the square footage cost goes up. It's just, it's, it's just physics. And that was overwhelming, the amount of work that you've done in, what, is it about five or ten years? I remember that real architecture, 1988. That's really fun to see that again. I didn't remember it until you showed it again, but that was a, that was a great exhibition. I wanted to ask you just a little bit more about, you know, there's 50 buildings to ask you about, but Lady Margaret Hall. And that's really fun that you got to work add to buildings by other architects, some of which Blum feel fairly important. And then Aerith, who's so important as continuity. Now, I've never really loved that building that he did, but anyway. Other people tell me it's great. Why were you able to actually, uh, you created quads, I saw that, with L-shaped buildings, but you weren't able to attach them. Is there a reason for that? And why wouldn't they let you take out those really nice 1950s buildings? 
we couldn't attach because they're designed as point blocks. So you've got windows all around the edge that you can attach. We tried to attach certain things to them to build something at the ground floor level and so on. You know, this is what happens. It was one of the concessions you end up making. And the building, they wouldn't knock down the buildings because that's a wasted effort. You know, they've got these buildings. They want more buildings. The pressure is to have more space. And you come along and say, I'm not going to give you more space until you take down two buildings. It doesn't wash. And you just have to do your best. Those buildings might come down in the future. And what you're designing isn't going to preclude that at all. If anything, it makes it easy to add new buildings, which will fit in so much better. So what you have to do is just make it work. And there are ways that you can do that. On the ground, when you're in Lady Margaret Hall, it just feels like a set of quads. And the, the existing buildings just somehow disappear because they agree they're, they're the same brick. So they carry through and you just get, instead of having two point blocks, which stand there like a, two sore thumbs, uh, they become part of a row, a row of buildings, which gives you a facade. Even though they're not touching one another, they still give you that facade. So that's where it is. How do people at an institutional level build? In the United Kingdom versus the U.S. In, in the United Kingdom, there is a great tradition of taking the long-term view, particularly with institutions like Oxford and Cambridge colleges. If anything, if you go to Oxford and Cambridge, you'll see there's a hell of a lot of modern buildings, now, which is rather sad because they aren't, they, they don't add to the place and contribute as positively as a traditional building would. That's because there's money there. And a lot of these institutions, even though they're modern buildings, have been well built. They've been rather solidly built, which is even worse tragedy because they're not going to come down that easily. But so that, that long-term tradition is much more ingrained. And it comes from the large estates known that all inclined to take the longer approach. It's usually a lot takes or costs less in the long run. If you build properly in the first place, it might cost you more in the first place, but you then don't have to spend the same amount of money later on, either renewing it or refurbishing it or adding to it or, or upgrading it. So there is a tradition, but if it's come under a lot of pressure, probably the years since, I suppose, in, in the latter end of the 20th century, they came under a lot of pressure to actually do things. I suppose the way it's much more common in this country to build for the short term, we'll leave it at that. But just to give you another example of Paternoster Square, the buildings, the modern buildings that were built in the 1950s in Paternoster Square looked like concrete buildings. But they were actually built of Portland stone. Portland stone was disguised to look like concrete. So they weren't cheap. So they weren't building cheap buildings. And they thought they were doing the right thing. Uh, they were just badly advised. It was done by a conservative government who thought they were building next to the cathedral. So therefore, they should build in stone. What they should have realized, not only should they have not built in stone because you wanted the contrast between the stone of the cathedral and the humble buildings around it. So they should have built in, in, in brick, but that, that stone was a complete waste of money because it was built onto buildings, which were not sustainable and had to be taken down only 25 years later, it was 19, it was in the 1970s that they started thinking about taking them down literally 25 years later. On a percentage basis, what would you say the delta would be between an Oxford Cambridge building and this building? Could I just what final construction cost lies? I think probably, probably it, we would have spent more on an Oxford building. Yeah. 
we would have spent more on the Oxford building here, here, we were under more pressure. And in a way, we had to come up with clever means to counteract it. I mean, one of the reasons why, for instance, the, and, and drove the terrace was because the terrace, you have an L-shaped building, you add all that square footage, and all you have to build is two walls. So you actually get a lot more square footage for a lot less expenditure on external walls. So by doing that, but being a, a single story building, it doesn't matter because you can get, you have the roof to use for ventilation and so on, which you can make it work in the long run. And then the other thing that, that we did here is we designed the, 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 the whole complex quite deliberately as a series of different types of building. And that was partly because we were trying to, if you've got a school of architecture, trying to build or, or, or build something that the students could actually learn from, it was quite important to build not just one type of building, but build different types of buildings because the kind of uh, 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 criteria and the kind of the hierarchy of, of principles that we, you would use to design something like a, a major civic building or a utilitarian building are different. So it made good sense to do that here, build a whole series of different buildings, like the Hall of Casts, like a chapel, and then you've got the studios upstairs were much more rudimentary and much more functional. And that, of course, helped with the whole business of expenditure because the vast majority of the building you're building at a cheaper per square foot cost, and you're concentrating where you are spending the money on a small part building. So you give the impression that you've spent a lot of money, but you're not necessarily doing it. So coming up with things like that to make it work. One thing that struck me, especially with many of your interventions in existing fabric is how incredibly contextual many of the projects are, and that, you know, it's not just simply related to the context, but it seems more of the context and you show that in a variety of, of ways. How do your approaches for new settlements with really only natural context as opposed to architectural or urban context, how does your approach change in terms of starting from scratch almost? You're not because you're building, if you're building in France, you're building in France. And the Alsace vernacular is different from the vernacular down by Toulouse. And although they are related, you can actually define that. And that's the whole point of a, of a code because you can actually then develop a code which reflects and you make that part of the uh, master plan. But of course, you shouldn't need to do that because in the past, people didn't need that and they naturally did it. The only reason we're having to do it today is people have lost the ability to do that. We have to do that with a master plan to make sure that you get that continuity. And of course, when we're designing our own, and a lot of them, we try to bring in this issue of variety in them. So you don't just have a code, which is just that. Okay. This is the code you have to design with the whole thing. You can break it down into character areas, and then you can give each character a certain part of that code. And they can vary just like a Georgian house varies from a Victorian house. So there is a variety that built in, which is in, in addition to the variety that comes from the different architects who are designing things, but you get a variety which is built in, which then follows a pattern. So that whole idea that I was talking about, that you can get a pattern, which is in there, which then also gives you a unity. So that's the thing. You can put building variety and then it just looks like a mess. But if you build it in so that it follows a certain pattern, the pattern that people can recognize, then you're building in a unity because then people can actually see how it all works. And as human beings, we love these puzzles. We love to go around and look there and say, oh, these buildings are different. And then ooh, work out how it all works. And some of us just do it, you know, instinctively and don't even think about it. Thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. <laughs>